morning. Wow, it got so bright so quick. Like, I could see you guys, and then all of a sudden I couldn't. Uh, but hey, good morning. Welcome to River Ridge Church. My name is Dylan. Uh, I am the director of student ministry here, and I love that part of my job. I love hanging out with middle school kids and high school kids and getting to talk to them about Jesus. Uh, but I also really enjoy getting to do this type of thing as well and getting to share with you all uh, about Scripture on Sunday morning. So Matt, thanks for the opportunity to do this. Um, I saw that Matt was trying to take credit for today's sermon. So if you look at your notes that you got when you walked in, it says Matt Santon is preaching. Um, I am not Matt Santon, although we do have similar hairlines. Mine is just going a little bit slower than his. Uh, but if you guys want to, after today, if the sermon's really great, then I'll be standing up here so you can tell me how good I did. But if the sermon's really bad, Matt will be standing right there so you can tell him how bad he did. Um, so this morning, I just want to go ahead and get started with prayer, and then we're going to be jumping back into our series about the book of Judges. And I've been given kind of a hard topic to talk about today, but I'm hopeful that today will be impactful if we can all just lean in to what the word of the Lord has for us today. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in this place, um, to sing worship songs to you, to hear uh, from your word, to learn about life, to learn about ourselves, to learn about you. And God, as we sing these worship songs this morning, help our worship to be genuine, but uh, this morning reveal to us that there might be other things in our life that we're worshiping as well. So draw our hearts into you uh, and help us to have a good morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, uh, this morning we're starting back in our series about the book of Judges. Uh, by show of hands, who has been doing the reading plan? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Some of you guys? Cool. Uh, the book of Judges is a really, really weird book of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of things in the book of Judges that are super messy. Um, one of my favorite sermons that we had during this series, and you might remember back, was Matt talked about this story of a guy named Ehud, who stabbed this fat king in the stomach and then poop shot out of his belly. And I say that because there's middle schoolers in here and they're like, what have we been missing? Like, why have we been in Wired? Um, but yeah, that was a crazy story. And then uh, last week, Keith talked to us about Abimelech. And then uh, this week, we're actually not talking about one of the judges, um, but there is a judge that we're skipping over. So if you check out uh, chapters 10 through 13-ish, uh, there's this really wild judge who I think, uh, plot twist, spoiler alert, sacrifices his daughter or something crazy like that. And so with all that said, the book of Judges is a really, really weird book. And it led me to start asking some questions as I was reading through it and hearing these sermons. And the questions that kept coming to mind were things like this. Why in Judges is all the violence necessary? Like, why is there so much violence if we talk about God being a God of peace and love and forgiveness? Why is there so much violence? Another question, why did we need the judges, right? And remember, we were talking about these, uh, and just a recap, the judges were not like what you think of as a courtroom judge. They were more of a military leader, and a lot of times they did some really messy things to save the Israelites. Uh, another question I had is, why did it have to get to this point? right? Why did it have to get to the point where people were killing each other, and in some weird way it was kind of working out God's plan? And finally, the question that I had was, why were the Israelites enslaved in the first place? If we remember in the Old Testament, the Israelites were God's chosen people. But in the Old Testament, we see time and time and time again that they are enslaved, they are persecuted, they are exiled, they are killed. So why did that happen? And so this morning, uh, we're not going to be talking about a specific judge. This morning, we'll be talking about a topic that comes up time and time again in the book of Judges, but also comes up time and time again throughout the entirety of Scripture. And that topic is idolatry. Uh, this morning, I walked up to one of the middle school kids, and I said, hey, you guys don't have Wired today. Uh, we're going to be talking about idolatry, and I'm preaching. And she looked at me, and she said, we're talking about the Dollar Tree? And I said, no. No. We're talking about idolatry, but this morning I realized that some of you guys in here may have an understanding of what that term idolatry might mean. You might be able to kind of think through it and figure it out, but there also might be some of you guys in here that have no idea, and you're like, that's a churchy term that I've never heard. And so what I'm going to do today, what I'm hopeful we accomplish, is I want to look at Judges, and I want to see the theme of idolatry all throughout the book of Judges. And then I want to take us a little bit further out to the New Testament and see that that practice of idolatry 
was still there. And I want to finish up by hopefully drawing our hearts closer to God's by realizing that we are all guilty of idolatry as well. And so Matt has been showing us uh, this cycle of the book of Judges. You guys can see it up behind me. And we've talked about how time and time again, the Israelites were enslaved and persecuted and the judges came up and killed the leader and it got really crazy. But what I wanted us to focus in on today is that that first point of the cycle says this, the people fall in to sin and idolatry. And so, like I said, we see this coming up right in the beginning of the book of Judges, and we kind of talked about it already, but I want to reread some of these passages because I think they're important to us and to our discussion this week. And so the first one, the first time we see idolatry in the book of Judges, it's in chapter 2, and it starts in verse 1. It says this, The angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you out of Egypt, and I led you into the land that I had promised to your ancestors. So what's happening here is the angel of the Lord is saying to the Israelites, I have done, God has done what he promised he would do. He brought you out of exile. He led you in to uh, this land that was promised to you. And for the Israelites, that was kind of a pretty cool thing. God had promised them something and he had delivered on that thing. But it goes on to say this. I also said that I will never break my covenant with you and you are not to make covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You're to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What have you done? Therefore, I now say, I will not drive these people out before you, and they will be thorns in your side, and their gods will be a trap for you. And so what's being said to the Israelites is they had been given this mission to drive the people out of the land, not blend the cultures, and kind of stay pure. And what's being said to the Israelites here is you didn't do what I told you to do. And because of that, there's going to be a consequence. And that consequence was less of a struggle between man against man, the Israelites against these other cultures, as much as it's a spiritual struggle. It says that the gods will be the trap. And for the Israelites, they probably immediately thought, well, we'll never worship any other gods other than you. But we see throughout Judges that that's not what happens. Uh, In verse uh, 17, still of chapter 2, it says this, but they did not listen to their judges. Instead, the people prostituted themselves with other gods, bowing down to them. Uh, It goes on to say in verse 19, whenever the judge died, the Israelites would act even more corruptly than their ancestors, following other gods to serve them and bow and worship to them. It goes on in uh, chapter 3. The Israelites took, uh, took their daughters as wives for themselves. They gave their own daughters to their sons, and they worshiped their gods. Notice that's a lowercase g. So it's not talking about the God of Israel. It's talking about the gods of the other cultures. Uh, it goes on in chapter 5 to say this. Israel, collective, the nation, the people of God, chose new gods, and then there was war in the city gates. You see, in Judges, there is time and time and time again these instances where it tells us that the people decided to make a choice, and when it came down to choosing God, the one who had provided for them, taken them out of exile, and delivered on his promises, they continually chose the other options. They chose other gods. Um, I'm kind of a nerd. I like to really dig into scripture and see what it has to say. And so I ran a search in a software that I have, uh, and I looked for the term gods, and then I looked for the term God and kind of separated those out to make sure that we had them uh, in the correct position. And I found out this. There is a ton of times that the word worship or worshiping or worshiped is used in the book of Judges. Three times more often It's used to talk about the Israelites worshiping other gods rather than Israel worshiping their God. So the thing is, as we look at this cycle in Judges, we realize that for the Israelites, idolatry wasn't really the exception. It was more of their default. They kept coming back to the other gods of the other cultures time and time again. And that leads us to chapter 10, which is kind of our loose primary scripture for today. It's the place where I wanted to kind of camp out for just a minute, and it will lead us into the rest of our sermon. But in chapter 10, it says this. This is after Abimelech, which is we talked about uh, last week. So after Abimelech, Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, that's a 
really cool name and definitely one that I need to use for one of my kids when I have one, uh, became judge and began to deliver Israel. He was from Issachar and he lived in Shamir, the hill country of Ephraim. Tola judged Israel for 23 years and when he died, he was buried in Shamir. So we have 23 years of the judge ruling over Israel. And remember, during those times, we typically saw the Israelites kind of enjoying peace and living the life that they wanted to live. It goes on to say this, After him came Jair the Gileite, sorry, who judged Israel for 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. Back in that culture, having a donkey was a big deal. It was a sign of royalty. Uh, so what it's saying here is that they were very, very wealthy, and it was a time of prosperity in the nation. They had 30 towns in Gilead, which are still called Jair's villages today. And when Jair died, he was buried in Cayman. Then the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals, the Asheroths, the gods of Aram and Sidon and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. And then it kind of finishes up with one of the most depressing things you can read in Scripture. It says, they abandoned the Lord and they did not worship him. So once again, in chapter 10, where we're camping out here for just a second, we see this cycle happen again. The judge is ruling, there's a time of prosperity, the judge dies, and then suddenly the Israelites kind of lose their way again. And I really, like I said, I think this is one of the saddest things we can read in Scripture. They abandoned the Lord, and they did not worship him. So once again, in chapter 10, we find the Israelites in a key part of that cycle, and that key part that they're living in in that moment is idolatry. If we go back to what uh, was said in Judges 2, it told us that the gods were going to be a trap for them, and time and time again, those gods did prove to be a stumbling block for the nation of Israel. And so the thing is, we start to look at it, and we're like, man, those daggone Israelites worshiping other gods, bowing down to idols. And keep in mind, this is not like friendly worship. Like, I think that what we do here on a Sunday morning is pretty tame. Like, we sing some songs, maybe we raise our hands. Uh, but what we're talking about with worship here is child sacrifice and temple prostitution and really, really weird and horrible stuff. So, when we read that they abandon God and worship the other gods, we are seeing them completely turn their lifestyle around in the wrong direction. And so I think we look at Old Testament idolatry and we're like, well, the good thing is we don't have to deal with that now. Like, we don't have idolatry now. Like, I don't go home and pray to a little, like, thing on the mantle. Uh, I am certainly not sacrificing my kids. I don't have any kids. Uh, but if I did, I probably wouldn't sacrifice them, and hopefully you guys wouldn't either. But the thing is, idolatry doesn't live exclusively in the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, we read time and time again that there's scriptures about idolatry there too. It says this, this is Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 14. He says, so then, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. This is Paul writing to the earliest Christians, and one of the things he thinks is really important to write is that they need to flee from idolatry. The next thing it says is, now the works of the flesh, uh, this is in Galatians chapter 5, sorry, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things. And we look at that and we're like, yeah, all of those like, are things that I kind of understand. Uh, but it's really important to remember that in verse 20, Paul once again specifically names idolatry. In Colossians chapter, five, or chapter 3, he says this, therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. So the thing about it is, to Paul, these things that people are doing are actually all forms of worshiping other gods. They are taking other things into our life and making them more important than our relationship with the one true God. And then a final verse from the New Testament. This is 1 Peter chapter 4. For there's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles chose to do. Remember, this is kind of a, a jab when you reference the Gentiles. They were still pretty close to that barrier being broken down. And the Gentiles were viewed as kind of the outcast, the ones who weren't doing the right thing. And so this is kind of a subtle jab. So doing what the Gentiles chose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, uh, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. 
And so I think a lot of times when we see something in the Old Testament, we think, well, that was an Old Testament thing. It was like pre-Jesus, not a big deal anymore. But I think what it's, what, what's important for us to remember here is that when we look at the New Testament, we usually look at that and we say, there's something to apply here in my life. And throughout the New Testament, we still see the cycle of idolatry ruining people's lives. See, while idolatry in the Old Testament may be uh, more overt because it was worshiping uh, other gods, like literal gods, offering sacrifices to those gods, things like that, it's really clear that the New Testament writers felt that idolatry was a problem for the New Testament church. And plot twist, you and I are part of the New Testament church. We're just a continuation of what was started by Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. And so today, I want to just kind of cover the basics. What is idolatry? What are the consequences? And what do we do about it? And so if you're taking notes, there's a lot of blanks on there today. I encourage you to write those uh, things down. And then if you don't have one of those spiffy notebooks, please stop by the Welcome Center after we're done and grab a notebook and click it open. It's super satisfying. It's and then you put your notes in there, and then you go, and it like slam. Thank you. Someone demonstrated. Uh, I love the sound. Every Sunday after uh, Matt's done speaking, and I hear someone go, click. I'm like, yes, yeah, somebody is going to remember this sermon. Uh, so anyway, please take notes on that page. Uh, we're going to kind of move quickly through this next section um, because we have something cool at the end that I want to get to. So the first question that we have uh, when we're talking about idolatry is this. What even is idolatry? By show of hands, how many of you guys would think you might have an idea of what idolatry is? Kind of? Okay. Yeah. Um, when I was researching this question, I was really hoping for something that was super profound. Like sometimes when you're getting ready for a sermon, you're like, ah, I'm going to like look at the dictionary definition and that bad boy is going to be so cool. And I typed in dictionary.com and it was like super boring and vanilla. So uh, basically the answer I found is this. Idolatry is simply the worship of an idol. And that demands another question. What is an idol? You see, you and I think about idols in the sense of like Indiana Jones, he like runs into the temple or something, and there's like these little like, you know, goats or something sitting near a fire, and we're like, that's an idol. And we can kind of picture that. But the question, what is an idol? You know, if idolatry applies to us, then we're probably not worshiping that kind of idol. What's a better definition of that term? Pastor Tim Keller uh, who Matt has been using a lot during this sermon series, in another one of his books uh, called Counterfeit Gods, defines an idol like this. He says, An idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. One more time, I'm going to read that nice and slowly so it can sink in. An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you. You see, according to Keller, diagnosing an idol in our life is actually pretty easy. What are the things we think about more than God? What are the things we dwell on more than God? What are the things that we love, even if we wouldn't want to admit it, more than we love God? In Jeremiah 2.13, back to the Old Testament, we see a, a pretty clear picture of what idolatry is. Um, and in this scripture, basically what we're seeing is kind of a court case. And the prosecutor is God, and the defendants are the Israelites. And this is the primary case he's making against them. This is the Lord's declaration. For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. So for our first thing to take notes on, your first blanks on your page, I've kind of boiled down uh, idolatry into a two-part process that I think if we're honest with ourselves, we will admit we have all been guilty of at some point, or maybe even right now. Idolatry is the act of turning our attention away from God and turning our worship towards an idol turning our attention away from God and our worship towards an idol. So while you're writing, I'm going to take a drink because I have a horrendous tickle in my throat and it, I am just so parched. I try to do it quietly because sometimes Matt's really loud about it. Uh, if you listen, if you watch on the live stream, I, not, maybe not in person, Matt, 
I love you. Don't fire me. Uh, if you watch on the live stream, I swear, sometimes that bottle comes up and it's like, and then he like goes on and tells us all about Jesus. And I can't fault him for it because I get it. Like when you're up here in the lights and it's just hot and then you need a drink. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hear about it later. I promise. Uh, anyway. So guys, I have an illustration today. I love illustrations. I'm in student ministry. We do illustrations all the time. Sometimes they're more fun than others. Sometimes they involve cheese puffs being thrown at a middle school kid's face, but not today. Um, But I have an illustration to show us a little bit of what idolatry is. And so here I have a... (laughs) Thank you. You guys were like, I don't know, maybe it's a true question. A flashlight. I love flashlights. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to play with lights, like fireworks and lighters and flashlights, and I just loved all of it. <laughs> the light in my room, just sit there and click it on and off, like create a light show while I was listening to my jazz music. It was wild in high school. Uh, anyway, here I have a flashlight, right? And flashlights have a couple basic parts to them right? It's really pretty simple. A flashlight typically has some type of body to it, right? Like an encasing thing that holds some stuff in there. It has a light that hopefully is getting turned on, and then usually some type of battery, right? Some type of battery, whether it's a rechargeable battery, a AA battery, a 9-volt battery. Um, I hate 9 volts. Those are the worst because I used to lick them because my brother told me that that's how you tested them. Uh, Don't do that. Anyway, so I... I talked to my mom and she said, no jokes this Sunday. And I said, I promise, but we're trying. Uh, So anyway, when you have the body of the flashlight and you have the batteries and they're installed properly, the light works, right? It's a simple process. A body, battery, creates light. And for the sake of our illustration today, I want to kind of pitch it this way. The body represents us, you and I, right? Any human being that has ever lived the body is us. The battery is God. And if the body and the battery, with some mechanical kind of technological voodoo in there, is working together, it uh, provides us light. And this is the goal of the flashlight. It's literally in the name, light. And so whenever we are connected to God, we have this life to the full that Jesus tells us he came to give us in John 10.10. He says, I have come to give you life to the full. And that's the representation of the light. The problem is that in our world, a lot of times, this relationship that causes there to be light and life to the full and life the way we were uh, meant to experience it, it gets broken, right? And we call that sin. uh, And today we're going to call it idolatry. And what happens is we remove God from the equation. So then all we're left with is this big empty housing, the body, which is us, and we are empty without God, and the light. And the problem is, if I were to put this on here and screw it on and then click the button, there would be no light. It's not providing the function it's supposed to. We know that something is broken, and we know that there's something we need to do to fix it. And this is where the problem comes in. You see, instead of reaching back immediately for God and replacing him to his rightful position in our life, a lot of times we start to look to other things that we think will fix our life. We start to worship them. We start to give all our attention to them, like Tim Keller said. And so I have a couple of them here that I'm going to show you uh, via paper for a reason. And I think these are some modern examples of things we try to fill our life with, things that we worship, whether subconsciously or consciously, but they never seem to work. So there are things like money, right? And I think a lot of us, like, we have pure intentions. We're like, well, I just want to have, like, a good life, and I want to be able to provide for my family and do all those things. Money is not necessarily a bad thing, but when our life becomes all about the pursuit and the worship of money, we've fallen into idolatry. And no matter how much money you have, it will not fix your life. Another one uh, represented by a picture of me. Um, just joking, that's not me, that's Ryan Reynolds from the movie Free Guy. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, it's excellent. Another one we fall into is uh, the idol of identity and appearance. And we're like, man, if I could just lose all that weight or work out all the time, and for the record, like, I obviously don't work out, but you guys would do that. Like, hats off to you. That's awesome. It's a good thing. But when your life becomes all about how you look and all about working out and eating right and all those different things, you've made your identity and your appearance an idol. Another one that I have that we don't like to admit, uh, but I think it's super valid, is sports, right? 
Like, I think sometimes we just, we're like, you know what, like, I don't need to go to church. Like, I got other things to do. Like, my kids have games, and there's a game coming on or whatever. Like, I can skip my small group tonight because there's a a Vikings game on, and they're going to lose anyway, but it's okay. Uh, Just mentally preparing myself for the fall. Um, But I think sometimes we place sports in a position in our life where it actually becomes an idol. It's something we worship. It's something that's more important to us than our relationship with God. Another one that I think all of us are probably guilty of is our cell phones and technology. And some of you guys are probably like, no, like I just use my cell phone to take pictures and like scroll on TikTok and stuff. Uh, A couple really quick um, little technology, uh, I don't know, facts for you. The average American spends four hours a day looking at their cell phone. Four hours a day. The amount of times that I'm, I'm going to call the high school kids out, the amount of times that I've talked to high school kids and they say, I just don't have any time to read my Bible or go to small group or come to church, but they spend four hours-ish a day looking at their phone. It gets worse. Uh, 15 to 23-year-olds, which is kind of a group that I like to focus on, 15 to 23-year-olds spend 2,800 hours, I think, a year, on digital content, right? That's watching TikTok and Netflix and Stranger Things, which is not bad things inherently. They spend 2,800 hours on digital content and they spend 300-ish on spiritual content. Man, that feels like an idol, doesn't it? That feels like we're placing our focus and our time and our attention on something other than God. Another one that's a good thing, and it's a great thing, but we sometimes make it an idol, is our family our marriages, our kids, our relationships, our friends. These are things that God has given to us to enjoy, but Scripture is very clear that a lot of times the worst idols are the ones that God has given to us, and we blow them out of proportion. The final one that I had, and this is the one that I really think we have to be careful of, is politics and ideologies and political leaders and political parties and cable news, and all of these things that we devote so much of our time and our attention to, and they make us feel worse and worse about ourselves, worse and worse about our country and our world, and worse and worse about our neighbors who we are called to love. You see, you could take any of these things, and for the sake of our illustration, we'll use the politics one today. You could take any of these things, and you can make it a focus in your life, and you can really start to dwell on it and hold on to it so tightly. And then I think a lot of times what we say is, man, if we could just elect the right person, or if I could just have a happier family, or if I could look different, or if I could have more money, we put that into our life, expecting it to fix everything. The problem is, we got the body, and we have the light, but it still doesn't work. See, the thing about it is, idolatry never works. And the things that we uh, give our time and our attention and our worship to never, ever work. They have consequences, and it moves us on to the second part of our notes. What are the consequences of idolatry? And the early part of Judges literally says that the gods were going to be a trap. I think there's three major consequences that I've thought of of idols, and I want to share them with you guys. The first one is this. Idols always let us down. You see, the Israelites turn their worship to other gods time and time again, and guess what? Those gods never provided for them. See, when work is our idol, we spend all of our time working overtime, and we miss out on time with our family and time at church, uh, and that idol lets us down. When sex is our idol, which is one that I talk about with high school kids a ton, we end up hooking up with people who really don't care about us and ultimately end up hurting us. If we make that our idol, it's going to let us down. When our phones are our idol, we get addicted and we spend too much time looking at a screen that makes us feel crappy about our real life because everybody else is going on cool vacations, everybody else has nice things, but maybe if I just scroll a little bit more, maybe I'll get happy. It never seems to work. And when politics becomes our idol, we waste our nights away watching news that enrages us And like I said, causes us to hate our neighbors. Jesus told us there were two primary callings for us in this life. One, love God. Two, love our neighbors. If politics and news and current events is causing a breakdown of that second part, it's absolutely an idol. 
and we have got to get rid of it. The second consequence that I thought of is that idolatry or idols make us blind to what God is doing. You see, the thing about it is, for the Israelites, they have been provided for time and time and time and time and time again. But because of the idols where they were directing their attention, they forgot about the provision and the presence of God in their life. And eventually they'd come back to him and they'd say, hey, we're sorry. But man, did they miss out on some really cool stuff that God was trying to do because they were focused in on those idols. You see, when we idolize things like technology or entertainment or sex or money or things or appearance or politics, we miss out on the goodness of God that is all around us. And I'm here to tell you guys, a lot of times this world feels really broken, but God is still good. He is who he says he is, but we're missing it because of our idolatry. And finally, idolatry puts a strain in our relationship with God. It puts a strain in our relationship with God. It doesn't take too much explaining here, Right? If we're worshiping other things, we cannot worship with our full capacity the God who created us, loved us, and died for us. And so idolatry puts a strain on our our relationship with God. You know, I think about it in the sense of this. If I'm married uh, and I have a great wife, but what if immediately I just started spending time with everyone else other than her and doing other things that she didn't want to do and I literally spent all my time away from her? That relationship isn't going to be healthy. The same thing happens in our relationship with God. And so we're going to wrap up here. Um, I've gone a little bit long, but I want to really finish us up here strong with this final question. What do we do in light of our idolatry? And I hope that you guys realize as we reread here in a second that Tim Keller quote, that we all have an idol in our life. There's always something that we're hyper-focused on. So what do we do in light of that idolatry? And at the end of chapter 10, these are the steps that the Israelites take. The first one is this, diagnose the idol. Diagnose the idol. The second one is repent of the idolatry. And the third one is remember God's forgiveness. Because we're not one of those churches that comes in and yells at you and steps on your toes and then says, like, go out and fix yourself. We're one of those churches where you come in and a necessary part of this process is just remembering the forgiveness that God has already provided for us. So here in a second... uh, I'm going to give us some time just to reflect. I'm going to put up a couple different prompts on the screen, and then it's going to lead us into our time of communion. You should have received communion cups on the way in. Um, And so here in a second, I'm going to give us some time to reflect on just a couple of the things we talked about, and then we're going to finish with communion and a song. And so the first thing that I want you to do, you can either bow your head, close your eyes, or if you want to look at the screen here in a second, you can. The first thing I want us to do is ask ourselves, what are my idols? I want us to diagnose them. If you could put that quote back up on the screen for me, the one from Tim Keller. It says, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God and anything that you seek to give you only what God can give. For about the next 30 seconds, quietly... I would like us just to ask God, what are those things in my life that I've made an idol? What are the things that have become more important to me than you? I think if we're honest with ourselves and we ask God to reveal these things, he will. I don't think that they're really that much of a secret to us. I think we know them. I think we interact with them every day and we know that they're letting us down. And we know that that life that God promised us isn't what we're living. And I think that we know that those idols are the barrier to that. So what do we do with that? The next thing is this. We repent of our idolatry. Go back one slide, please. Uh, Back one more to the prayer. Um, We repent of our idolatry. And so a lot of you guys might be like, I don't know what repentance is, and I don't know what it means to repent of something. I made it easy for you. I wrote up a little prayer that you can pray, or you can say this in your own words, but it's something along the lines of, hey God, I'm sorry that I have idolized something in my life, that I've worshipped it more than I've worshipped you. And for the next 15 or 20 seconds, I want us just to take a time together here of repenting of that idol, whatever God has brought to our mind.
you know, the cool thing about our faith is that it doesn't always have to be apologies to God. It doesn't end there. You know, the cool thing is that we serve a risen Savior named Jesus who 2,000-ish years ago died on a cross for every single one of you because he loved you. And so the final part of this process is to remember God's forgiveness. And this morning we're going to do that through the practice of communion. Uh, There's a verse in Romans, if you'll put that up, that says this. But God proves his own love for us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what that tells me is that while I still had an idol in my heart and in my mind and I was worshiping things that weren't God, he was willing to climb up on the cross and die so that I could be forgiven. And so here at River Ridge, when we practice communion, that's open to anyone who has placed your faith in Jesus anyone who claims to be a Christian. And if that's not you today, then I would invite you to do that. Today is a great day. And if you want to talk to somebody after service about that, uh, you can find myself or you can find Matt. And we would love to teach you how to turn your life over to Christ. But for those of you that are Christians, this moment of communion is a moment of remembering a couple things. The first one is the bread that represents Jesus' body that was broken for us, for our forgiveness. And the second is the blood that represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us, for our forgiveness. You see, there's no idol that's too big that God couldn't forgive it. And so here in a moment, I'm going to give you guys a second to take communion. We're not going to tell you when to do that. Uh, You can sit and pray or just have a moment of silence, and then you can take communion. And then when we're done, Gerald's going to sing a song for us. And I would encourage you guys to stand and sing and remember God's forgiveness and his provision as we finish this service.